girl named Karuki who used to spend most of her time playing games and watching TV is soon going to enter high school. She has the skill to handle over 50 relationships but all of those were just in games. So her life in high school was going to be completely different. She thought she would become the most popular girl as soon as she entered high school. But she was wrong. Koruki was not only innocent in appearance but also an introvert at heart which led her to face many challenges at school. We see Karuki in her high school deeply immersed in her studies. She has been attending this high school for over two months now. She is troubled by the fact that not a single student has made an effort to talk to her so far. The girl who once believed herself to be popular is now coming to the realization that she might not be as popular as she thought to the point where others would initiate conversations with her. Then in her class, she notices two girls chatting with some boys from the same class. Kuruki feels a pang of jealousy as she observes them all mingling and talking with ease. During class, Kuruki learns that there's an important exam coming up soon. This sparks a plan in her mind. She decides to aim for the top score in this exam. She believes that by excelling and passing with flying colors, she can gain fame and popularity among her peers, something she has longed for. However, as she snaps back to reality, she realizes that the school day has ended, and it's time for her to head home. As she leaves, Karuki notices that the boys and girls around her are engaged in lively conversations with each other. This scene feels somewhat odd to her, and she can't quite grasp why all these boys are seemingly ignoring her. She walks home, pondering over this, feeling a mix of confusion and a sense of being out of place in this new environment where she had once thought she would shine. Ignoring everyone around her, Karuki decides to leave school. Just then, her eyes fall on her class teacher, who is bidding goodbye to the students as they leave her home. As Karuki approaches the gate, her teacher wishes her goodbye too, but surprisingly, she finds herself unable to respond. In that moment, it becomes evident that Karuki, despite her attempts to appear bold, is actually quite introverted and struggles with responding to people. Feeling embarrassed about her inability to reply, Karuki quickly leaves the school. Once home, she collapses onto her bed. The entire day had been rather difficult for Karuki. She couldn't understand why she wasn't attracting the attention of others. Usually, she would find solace in playing games during her free time, but in reality, she felt alone and lonely. Doubting herself, she stands in front of a mirror to take a closer look. The sight of her own face in the mirror makes her scream in fright. She realizes that she lacks the kind of beauty that attracts boys, a revelation that deeply unsettles her. With no other options in sight, Karuki sits in front of her computer and starts searching for secrets to enhance her beauty. She spends the next few hours scouring the internet for solutions. Eventually, she finds some tips to make herself look better. She tries on her school dress and her father's glasses in an attempt to look cute. Meanwhile, at her home, her younger brother enters. He is taken aback when he sees his sister's new look for the first time. It wasn't that Karuki was looking exceptionally good. In fact, compared to before, she seemed to look even worse. She soon realizes that she cannot force herself to be beautiful, no matter how hard she tries. In the next scene, we see Karuki changing her clothes again. She has come to understand that rather than focusing on her appearance, she needs to work on her conversation skills. This lack of communication ability is what sets her back from others. She decides to seek help from her younger brother. We see her entering her room to ask for his assistance. Initially, her brother is confused about what his sister wants from him. But after a bit of conversation, he realizes that Karuki wants to improve her conversation skills. Externally, her brother tries to appear annoying with Karuki, but deep down, he is genuinely concerned about her. Without wasting much time, he agrees to help her. However, this decision soon turns into a challenge for him. As he starts listening to Karuki's trivial talk, he realizes it's almost unbearable for an ordinary person to endure. He begins to regret agreeing to help her, wondering how he could have been so naive. After a lengthy conversation, Karuki starts to feel that she might be able to face people more easily. The next morning, as she heads out to school, she notices some boys and girls planning to go to karaoke together. Obviously, she finds their plan utterly pointless, although deep down, she feels jealous seeing them hang out and have fun together. Reaching the school gate, where her class teacher is present, she prepares herself for another goodbye. This time, instead of running away in fear, she makes an effort to say goodbye back to her teacher, which she manages to do so successfully. This was the first time Karuki had successfully responded to her teacher, indicating that her efforts from the previous night had paid off. Elated, she heads home, but before that, she decides to buy a gift for her brother as a reward for his help. She arrives at a supermarket and picks out a gift for her brother. As she approaches the counter to pay, Karuki is taken aback when she sees the receptionist. He's a strikingly handsome young man, almost like a celebrity. She's unsure how to speak to such an attractive guy. Overwhelmed with nervousness, she quickly says whatever comes to mind and hastily leaves the store. As she's about to head home, Karuki's attention is drawn to groups of girls enjoying themselves in various restaurants. 
She feels a pang of jealousy seeing them and decides she too wants to enjoy herself in a restaurant like them. Kuruki then spots a fast food restaurant nearby. This would be her first time going to a restaurant like this, intending to enjoy herself like an ordinary girl. Gathering her courage, she steps into the restaurant. With her entry into the restaurant, Kuruki faces a new challenge. She needs to order for herself, which requires her to interact with the receptionist. Due to her lack of conversational skills, this becomes a difficult task for her. Despite the struggle, she eventually manages to order a burger. Sitting in a quiet corner, Haruki starts to enjoy her meal. With the first bite, she realizes why so many people enjoyed burgers. It was delicious, something she had never experienced before. As she finishes her meal and prepares to leave, another problem arises. Kuruki notices that some students who have just arrived and taken the adjacent seats are her classmates. Being an introvert, she does not want to be noticed by them. She starts looking for a way to leave without being seen. After some effort, she finds a path to exit and begins to sneak past her classmates, hoping to go unnoticed. Surprisingly, Koruki manages to leave the restaurant without being noticed by any of the students. She had put on a poker face that made her unrecognizable to others. Just as she was leaving, another problem arises. Her younger brother and his friends happen to be enjoying a meal in the same restaurant. When they see Koruki with her poker face, they are initially startled and can't recognize her. However, her brother quickly understands her antics. Instead of interacting with Kuruki, her brother chooses to ignore her and continues to have fun with his friends. They start talking about Kuruki's poker face, making jokes about it. Reluctantly, her brother finds himself joining in the mockery. Feeling embarrassed and upset by her actions, Kuruki leaves the restaurant and sits down in a nearby park, overwhelmed with sadness. Soon after, we see her younger brother, who, realizing the impact of their teasing, comes to the park to comfort his sister. Moving forward, we find Kuruki again, who is now trying to leave her past behind and live in the present. She prepares for school as usual, but before leaving, she receives a call. It's from Yu Chan, her childhood friend. Yu Chan shares that she misses Kuruki and plans to visit her the following Saturday. This news increases Kuruki's anxiety. In school, they were known as nerdy students, and now Kuruki worries about what she'll tell Yu Chan about her school life. To alleviate her concerns, Kuruki heads to school with a new purpose. She wants to create some significant memories in the next five days, hoping to gather stories to share with Yu Chan. Despite her enthusiasm, Koruki's school life remains uneventful. She still keeps herself apart from the others and continues to feel jealous when she sees people interacting. As Koruki is heading home after school, she encounters a couple talking right in front of her, blocking her way. Their conversation prevents Koruki from moving forward. Understandably, anyone in her position might have felt irritated and Koruki's frustration skyrockets. However, before she can react, the couple moves on. During this moment, Karuki's attention is drawn to the girl's panties, sparking her curiosity about the kind of underwear the girl wears that seems to attract boys. Standing in the middle of the pool area, she starts lamenting her fate. She feels sad because she hasn't made any school friends yet, and she's worried about what stories she'll tell Yu Chan. The next day, Karuki musters up the courage to try again to create memories at school. However, her situation remains unchanged. Everyone is busy chatting with each other, and she continues to feel ignored. During class, Kuruki gets lost in her game fantasies and falls asleep. When she wakes up, she is startled to hear her name announced over the school's intercom. She's surprised because the school authorities have called her to the office. Later, we see that Kuruki and another student were summoned to the office for missing several classes. As a consequence of their absence, they had lost their chance to participate in their project. Their punishment was to attend art class together, and they had to do it alone without the company of other students. Kuruki, however, finds a silver lining in the situation. She starts to fantasize about fulfilling all her wishes with this boy, even considering the possibility of making him her boyfriend. We then see them in the art class together. Kuruki is anxious, thinking about how to start a conversation with the boy. But before she can gather enough courage to speak to him, he finishes his painting and leaves the class. Kuroki is left in shock, realizing she just missed her opportunity to connect with the boy. Now alone, she dedicates herself to making her own painting. After much effort, she completes her first painting and feels proud of it. Eagerly, she goes to show it to her teacher. The teacher is somewhat surprised by her painting because Kuruki has depicted the same boy she was supposed to work with in class. Interestingly, the boy in her painting looks quite different from his real appearance. Although Kuruki couldn't foster a real connection with the boy, she's prepared a list of fabricated memories. She plans to share these made-up stories with Yu Chan, hoping to paint a different picture of her school life. The long-awaited Saturday finally arrives and Kuruki meets Yu Chan after many years. She is astonished to see the girl approaching her. Yu Chan had transformed into a beautiful young lady. Kuruki is especially surprised because, like her, Yu Chan was a nerdy student in their childhood, but now she has changed completely. 
Feeling demotivated by this unexpected transformation, Kuruki and Yu Chan go to a restaurant together. At the counter, Yu Chan confidently orders coffee for herself, showing no signs of difficulty in communicating. Unlike Kuruki, she isn't introverted at all. As they start chatting, Kuruki initially planned to share her fabricated memories, but seeing Yu Chan's transformation and confidence, she loses the motivation to share her made-up stories. During their conversation, Yu Chen reminisces about their childhood, particularly the times when they used to enjoy themselves together. Back then, Kuruki had different interests, focusing on games and anime. As soon as anime is mentioned, Kuruki lights up with excitement and starts talking animatedly about various anime topics. Yu Chan listens happily, feeling as if they have been close since childhood. After spending some time together, Yu Chan reveals how happy she is to be spending time with Kuruki, which deeply touches her. They then head out to play games, and Yu Chan spots an arcade game they used to play together in their childhood. Kuruki, showing renewed interest in the game, starts playing, and unsurprisingly, she plays much better than before. Both Kuruki and Yu Chan have a great time rekindling their childhood joy. Later, they find themselves in a park. This was the first time Kuruki had fully enjoyed an entire day with a friend, and she doesn't want this experience to end just yet. Kuruki asks Yu Chan where they should go next, to which Yu Chan responds with a hint of sadness, saying she needs to return home as it has gotten quite late. Kuruki wants to spend more time with her friend but understands and agrees to Yu Chan's decision. So they both agree to head back to their respective homes. However, Kuruki is left feeling disheartened. She's disappointed that despite being similar to her childhood friend, Yu Chan managed to change and grow while she feels stuck in the same place. Feeling upset, Kuruki stops Yu Chan from leaving. She secretly plans to ask Yu Chan for help in changing herself. But when Yu Chan notices Kuruki's sad expression, she misunderstands the situation. Yu Chen thinks Kuruki is upset about a recent fight with her boyfriend and tries to console her. After offering words of encouragement, she leaves from there. Kuruki was heartbroken, she puts on her headphones and heads home. The next morning, the weather is rainy. Every student, including Kuruki, arrives at school with their umbrellas. The prolonged exposure to the rain has left her hair messy. After safely stowing her umbrella, she reaches her class and realizes she has forgotten her notebook for the next class. This poses a problem for her as being caught without her notebook would mean she have to share with the student next to her. However, Kuruki lacks the confidence to even speak to the boy sitting beside her. After much contemplation, Kuruki comes up with a plan to make herself practically invisible, hoping that no one will notice her physical presence. She tries to use what she thinks of as her ultra power to hide herself, but unfortunately, her attempt is unsuccessful. While teaching, the teacher's attention is drawn to Kuruki's empty desk. It becomes apparent to them that Kuruki has forgotten her notebook. The teacher, a bit annoyed, ultimately instructs her to share a book with the boy sitting next to her. Somehow, Kuruki manages to share the book with the boy beside her. As the class ends, we see all the students leaving for home. When Kuruki goes to retrieve her umbrella, she finds it missing. She quickly realizes that another student must have taken it. In her frustration, she mutters as many abusive words as she can think of, cursing the student who took her umbrella. However, the story takes a twist. When Kuruki looks at a nearby spot, she discovers her umbrella there. It turns out she had been wrongly angry all this time. Afterwards, with her umbrella in hand, she heads home amidst a fierce storm. The rain is heavy, and while walking, she reaches a pool. There, her gaze falls on the ripples in the water flowing into the pool. As she stands on the edge to enjoy the view, a stranger suddenly grabs her hand and pulls her back. Kuruki is initially angry at the stranger, but when she looks up and realizes it's her school teacher, she understands the situation. Her teacher had seen her getting too close to the pool and intervened to keep her safe. After apologizing to the teacher, Kuruki seeks shelter as her umbrella has been swept away by the strong storm. With no other option, she has to stay in the park. Soon, two students run to the same shelter to escape the rain. Kuruki is not particularly happy about their arrival. In fact, she's nervous about having to interact with them. The students try to strike up a conversation with her, but Kuruki is initially unable to say a word. Realizing the need to respond, she musters the courage to make a small joke, attempting to break the ice and engage in the conversation. Kuruki's joke turns out to be so lame that nobody laughs, leaving her feeling embarrassed. In her discomfort, she escapes to the restroom, seeking a moment to hide and compose herself. After gathering her courage, when she returns to her original spot, she finds that the two students have left. Kuruki sadly assumes that no one wants to be around her and feeling dejected, falls asleep there. While Kuruki is sleeping, the two students return, this time with a new umbrella. Contrary to Kuruki's belief, they hadn't left out of dislike. Instead, they had gone to buy a new umbrella for her, showing concern for her situation. They leave the umbrella beside her without waking her and quietly depart. 
When Karuki wakes up and sees the new umbrella, she is pleasantly surprised and touched. This gesture helps her realize that not everyone in real life is as bad as she had thought. She uses the new umbrella and heads home. Upon reaching home, Karuki heads straight to the bathroom, just as her younger brother returns home from school, soaked from the rain. He plans to use the bathroom too, but Karuki unknowingly prevents him from doing so. As a result, her brother quickly catches a cold and wakes up the next morning with a fever. Meanwhile, Karuki, while getting ready for school, feels reluctant to go because her previous day had been quite bad, including getting scolded by her teacher. She contemplates finding a way to skip school. She learns from her mom that her brother is sick and on bed rest, meaning he can't go to school that day. This news upsets her, and she tries to wake him up, but all her efforts fail. Reluctantly, Karuki goes to school, spending the entire period thinking about how she might feign illness to return home. Then, a stroke of luck, a ball flies through the air and hits her head. This incident becomes her ticket to getting out of school for the day. She heads home pleased with this unexpected turn of events, but she's not about to sit idle at home. Determined to get sick and miss school for a few days, Karuki devises a plan to catch her brother's cold. She enters his room under the guise of taking care of him, but her real intention is to transfer his cold to herself. She diligently tends to her brother, even eating the fruits brought for him. Suddenly, there's a knock at the door. Since her mom is busy, Karuki is asked to answer it. When she opens the door and sees two girls, she panics, unsure how to interact with them. Her anxiety increases when the girls reveal they've come to return a book to her brother. Kuruki is initially angry with her brother, yet she continues to care for him. After a whole night of trying to catch his cold, she's frustrated to find she hasn't fallen ill. Her efforts seem to have been in vain. By this time, her brother's condition has improved. He tells her that fever doesn't just happen suddenly, it usually takes a day or two to develop. Indeed, Karuki ends up getting sick, just like her brother, but she is far from pleased with her illness. In the middle of the night, feeling regretful about her decision to get sick, she checks her phone and looks up her school results. She had hoped for decent grades, but to her dismay, she only scores three marks. Disheartened, she goes to bed, trying to cope with her disappointment. Later that night, while playing on her game in console, Kuruki comes across a peculiar piece of information in her game. If a person sleeps on their head, they supposedly experience erotic dreams. Intrigued and seeking some form of pleasure, she decides to give it a try, but her attempts only turn into a joke. Despite several attempts, she ends up having only frightening dreams. Kuruki spends the entire night restless, grappling with her thoughts, leading to incomplete sleep. The next day, she arrives at school, still exhausted, and ends up falling asleep in the middle of the class. Her teacher, upon noticing this, is surprised. They see that Kuruki has dozed off during the lesson. But what is even more startling is that she appears to be having inappropriate dreams while asleep in class. Some time later, Karuki overhears another student talking about being hair dead on the train. Instead of empathizing, she finds this information amusing. Then we see Karuki on her way home, traveling by train. She is bothered by the fact that no strangers are sitting next to her, interpreting it as a lack of interest in hair her. This leads her to erroneously conclude that she must be the most beautiful girl on the train and therefore, no one wants to risk bothering her. Once home, Karuki calls Yu Chan to ask what the station means. When Yu Chan, concerned, suggests that someone might have tried to mold Karuki, she sees an opportunity to gain sympathy and falsely agrees with Yu Chan's assumption. The next day, Karuki boards the train again, and once more, no one approaches her. She feels somewhat upset about this, standing despondently in a corner. Her attention then shifts to the announcements, informing her that the train is about to reach the next station. Contrary to her expectations, a large crowd boards the train at the next station, causing Karuki to feel claustrophobic for the first time. She begins to fear that someone might take advantage of the crowded situation to behave inappropriately with her. Indeed, she soon feels like someone is touching her inappropriately in a area. Internally panicking, Karuki believes she is being arrested. After enduring what she perceives as a distressing journey, she gets off at a station. There, she realizes that no one was actually arresting her. It was all a misunderstanding on her part. Following the incident, Karuki arrives at her school and overhears some girls discussing their preference for fancy undergarments. Intrigued by this conversation, she decides she wants to try wearing fancy undergarments too. However, having never shopped for such items before, she realizes she needs help. Without hesitation, Karuki calls Yu Chan and explains her situation. Yu Chan agrees to help her. The next day, Karuki, ready for her new experience, goes shopping for undergarments and Yu Chan joins her to assist. Lacking any specific ideas herself, Karuki relies on Yu Chan, who takes her to her favorite shop where she usually buys her own undergarments. Karuki is astonished when she sees the shops around her. This was her first time in such a beautiful place. 
Excited about purchasing new undergarments, she asks Yu Chan to help her pick something nice, and Yu Chan obliges. After some effort, Yu Chan selects a garment and hands it over to Karuki. Initially, Karuki is delighted with the purchase, but this happiness is short lived. She hadn't even tried the garment on before buying it, and Sue starts regretting her decision. One day, due to the heat, Karuki decides to wear the new undergarment, but unfortunately, she is seen by a student, which embarrasses her greatly. She rushes to the bathroom to change and hastily disposes of the uncomfortable garment. Feeling dejected, Karuki heads home. On her way, her attention is captured by a new game that she finds intriguing. Unable to resist the temptation, she ends up purchasing the game. After reaching home, Karuki plays the new game and finds it enjoyable, eventually falling into a deep sleep while playing. That night, her father returns from work and wanting to check on his children before going to bed, enters Karuki's room. He finds the game still running and Karuki asleep on the floor. Gently, he picks her up and places her in bed. Later, Karuki watches a special TV show featuring an expressionless and silent girl who easily wins over her lover's heart. This inspires Karuki to believe that if she adopts a similar demeanor of being expressionless and silent, she might attract a lover like the girl in the show. Determined to try this new approach, Karuki resolves to spend the next day acting expressionless and silent, hoping to draw attention to herself in this manner. Soon after, her younger brother comes to see her, visibly upset about something. He asks Karuki if she drank his beverage. Engaged in her role play as a silent girl, Karuki nods her head in affirmation without speaking, indicating that she was indeed the one who tampered with her brother's drink. As a form of playful retribution, her brother grabs her head and spins it around. Maintaining her silent role, Kuruki goes to school, but to her dismay, no one finds her cool or unique. In fact, she's largely ignored, leading her to eat lunch alone again. This time, the solitude hits her harder and she begins to cry, lamenting her inability to make friends and feeling despondent about her fate. Gradually composing herself, Kuruki prepares to go home. On her way, she thinks of Yu Chan, who had dramatically changed her lifestyle over the years. Inspired by her friend's transformation, Karuki now aspires to live a life similar to Yu Chan's. Continuing her journey of self discovery, Karuki musters the courage to visit the same restaurant where she first went with Yu Chan. She bravely orders a coffee for herself and, upon taking her first sip, understands why people enjoy such a beverage. After finishing her coffee, she plans to leave, but unfortunately, she slips and falls to the ground. Feeling embarrassed and disheartened by this incident, she returns home. One day, while watching TV at home, Karuki sees a new segment about pub girls attracting many guys. Inspired, she decides to emulate their style. To do this, she learns how to light a cigarette lighter, thinking it could help her assist people in lighting their cigarettes, making her appear cool. After purchasing a lighter, Karuki goes to a park, where she waits for people to come by so she can light their cigarettes. Despite her efforts, Karuki's wish to light someone's cigarette isn't fulfilled until an opportunity arises. A man without a lighter approaches and she quickly offers her help. She feels successful in her first mission but realizes she needs to learn how to make drinks like a bar girl. She tries to practice this skill with her brother, who becomes quite upset with her antics. After many attempts, Karuki learns the skills necessary to act like a bar girl. Back at school, she looks at the other girls and feels a sense of superiority, thinking they are unaware of her newfound skills and feeling somewhat pity for them. Later, as she's heading home from school, Karuki decides to visit the place where bar girls usually hang out. Upon arriving, she first notices a beautiful girl being approached by a boy who asks her to come with him. Karuki doesn't quite understand the situation and looks around, observing everyone. She sees people flirting in groups of boys ogling at girls. Soon, Karuki realizes that coming to this place was a big mistake. Just then, she receives a call from her mother, who is worried about her. To reassure her mother, Karuki fabricates a story, saying she'll be home soon. Later, we see Karuki deeply engaged in playing a new game. She finds considerable pleasure in this game, and it starts to have a positive effect on her. The game brings a noticeable glow to her face, something even her younger brother picks up on. He's surprised to see his sister, who seemed so lost just the day before, suddenly looking so radiant. Karuki then reads her horoscope, which suggests that wearing black would be auspicious for her, as it's a color that attracts boys. Feeling encouraged by this, she heads to school with a newfound sense of confidence. On her way, she spots a vending machine selling a black-colored drink. Without much thought, she impulsively buys the drink. However, as soon as she drinks it, the drink explodes in her face. Despite this mishap, she arrives at school, still believing the day could turn out well. But she was mistaken as usual, everyone continues to ignore her, whether in class or during games. Feeling dejected, Koruki starts watching a group of ants and finding some joy in this begins to play with them. 
Unbeknownst to her, some ants climb up her leg and into her clothing. When she sits down in her class, she has already forgotten about the positive predictions of her horoscope. Then she notices a boy staring at her continuously. Kuriki mistakenly thinks her horoscope is finally coming true and is overjoyed, believing the boy is attracted to her. However, she is unaware that the boy is actually staring because he has noticed the many ants crawling on her clothes. This experience with the ants becomes a recurring issue for Kuruki, as several people notice the ants on her body. The next day, she again uses the same drink before going to school, but this time, it does not create any magical effect. Meanwhile, the city is preparing for the upcoming fireworks festival. Everyone is excited, making plans to attend with friends and family. Kuruki, however, feels disheartened as she finds herself alone again, with no one to accompany her to watch the fireworks. Furthermore, the school semester is coming to an end, and students are planning to go together to enjoy the fireworks festival. In contrast, Kuruki is isolated, feeling disappointed that she hasn't been able to make any friends throughout the semester. Feeling dejected, Kuruki visits a place from her childhood where she used to watch fireworks with her friends. To her surprise, she finds two boys already there, planning to watch the fireworks from the same spot. This place, once her secret, now seems to be known to others. Before leaving, Kuruki asks the boys if she can stay and watch the fireworks with them, and they agree. As the fireworks begin, the boys seem more interested in the adjacent hotel than the fireworks themselves. Initially confused, Kuruki soon realizes they are observing inappropriate activities happening at the hotel. This is the first time Kuruki has witnessed such things, and it starkly contrasts with the content of her games. With the school holidays underway, Kuruki resolves to create some good memories during this break. She spends the first day of her holiday playing games and watching TV, feeling content by nightfall for having successfully passed the day. Kuruki plans to spend her upcoming days similarly, enjoying her time alone. The following morning, she continues her routine of gaming and watching TV, spending several days this way. However, she soon realizes that she's spending all her time alone, without any reason to go outside. Sticking to transform her idle time into something more productive, Kuruki decides to buy a face cam, thinking she could use it to start a project or perhaps a video blog. Despite her efforts, she fails to achieve anything remarkable and eventually considers abandoning the plan. Frustrated and unsure how to make the most of her days, Kuruki starts to feel anxious about how she will spend the rest of her holiday. During her search for something meaningful to do, Kuruki stumbles upon an entry card to meet a celebrity. Realizing this could be an exciting way to spend her day, she decides to attend the celebrity meetup. After much effort, Kuruki arrives at the event. There, she observes other girls excitedly sharing their dialogues with the celebrity. After a long wait, it's finally her turn to meet the celebrity. But she finds it challenging to converse, she manages to speak to the celebrity, making her day feel worthwhile. Feeling fulfilled from her encounter, Kuruki returns home. That night, she approaches her brother and asks him to watch fireworks with her. Expecting him to refuse, she starts to leave without much hope. However, this time, her brother feels sympathy for her and agrees to join her. Kuruki and her brother watch the fireworks together, a moment of sibling bonding that Kuruki cherishes. Soon, Kuruki learns that her cousin Ki-chan is coming to visit. Ki-chan has always admired Kuruki, because Kuruki used to tell her impressive but untrue stories to appear cool. Now, Kuruki fears that Kimachan, who has grown up, won't be fooled by her stories anymore. To maintain her cool image, Kuruki decides to reinvent herself. She goes shopping in a mall to buy new, stylish clothes, hoping this will impress Ki-chan. However, upon returning home in her new dress, Kuruki is troubled by another thought. She had previously boasted to Ki-chan about having many boyfriends and leading a wild life. To make these stories seem believable, Kuruki decides to create fake kiss marks all over her body using a machine. But this task proves difficult. When her mother sees the marks on Kuruki's body, she strongly disapproves and instructs Kuruki to wear full-length clothes instead. Kuruki reluctantly complies with her mother's directive to wear full-length clothes. When Ki-chan arrives at their home, Kuruki as always tries to appear cool in front of her cousin. Following her mother's suggestion, Kuruki takes Ki-chan out for a stroll, and they end up in a library, where they read books. During this time, Kuruki tries to deflect every conversation to avoid revealing the truth about her exaggerated stories. At the library, Kuruki encounters the same boy who had bought her an umbrella during the rainy day previously. Ki-chan sees them talking and assumes the boy is Kuruki's boyfriend. When Kuruki learns about Ki-chan's assumption, she goes along with it, seeing an opportunity to maintain her cool image. The next day, when they return to the library, Ki-chan spots the boy with his actual girlfriend. This sight upsets Kuruki, as she realizes her lie is about to be exposed. Ki-chan begins to believe that Kuruki is upset because she's being cheated on by her supposed boyfriend. 
Kurunki, seizing the moment while in the restroom, approaches the boy and tries to explain that he shouldn't cheat on her with another girl. After leaving the restroom, she sees Kichan talking to the boy. Realizing her lies are about to be uncovered, Kuruki desperately tries to divert attention. She goes to the boy and asks Kichan to leave. Once Kichan is gone, Koruki kneels before the boy, apologizing for involving him in her deception. Kichan witnesses this and realizes that Kuruki has been telling her false stories since childhood, continuing to do so since her arrival. Despite the tension, Koruki and Kichan head home together, stopping to play arcade games on the way. Koruki, always good at gaming, impresses the other children with her skills. Watching Kuruki excel at the games, Kichan's anger subsides and she begins to see Kuruki in a new light. She realizes that although Kuruki might not be truthful, she is genuinely cool and interesting when it comes to gaming. After spending several enjoyable days together, Kichan leaves for her home, having had a great time with Kuruki. As Kuruki realizes that her school holidays are about to end, she plans to watch a movie with Yu Chan. However, the plan falls through because Yu Chan is busy working as a waitress at her uncle's restaurant. Invited by Yu Chan, Kuruki visits the restaurant and is surprised to see Yu Chan looking beautiful in her waitress uniform, charming customers with her cake making skills. Inspired by Yu Chan, Kuruki decides to try baking cakes herself. Her mother even helps her in this new endeavor, showing a supportive side. Later, Kuruki's mother asks her to help with household chores, but Kuruki, not particularly interested in domestic work, tries to avoid it as much as possible. Kuruki, feeling frustrated, directs her anger towards her younger brother. Despite being younger, he used to help with all the household chores, so she storms into his room and scolds him. Meanwhile, her mother, losing hope in Kuruki's willingness to help, assigns her the task of cleaning her room. Later, Kuruki learns about a meteor shower happening that night. She decides to watch it with her brother, but he refuses. Consequently, Kuruki ends up going to watch the meteor shower alone in a deserted park. There, she makes a wish to be able to blend in better with other students in the future. While enjoying a shower, she notices a stray dog wandering into the park and feels happy to have some company, making her day end on a positive note. Afterward, Kuruki's school reopens and she decides to sit among the other students this semester, unlike the previous one where she sat at the back. She thinks that by sitting in the midst of everyone, she can enhance her social interactions. Reflecting on her last semester, where sitting in the last row led to her not making any friends, Kuruki feels a bit sad. She had high hopes for this year, but slowly her optimism fades as, despite her efforts, everyone continues to ignore her. As lunchtime approaches, Kuruki comes up with a new idea. She thinks if she has lunch in front of everyone, people might come over because of her meal. Full of hope, she rushes to the restroom. However, upon returning, she sees a girl has moved her seat closer to her friends to enjoy lunch together, leaving Kuruki with nowhere to sit. With no other option, Kuruki leaves to find a special hideout for her lunch. To her surprise, she finds a spot that she really likes. After that incident, Kuruki becomes particularly fond of her new lunch spot and starts going there every day. As time passes, she grows to love this place. However, Kuruki's luck doesn't last long. One day, she rides her special hideout for lunch, only to find that it has been cleaned up and removed. Seeing her cherished spot destroyed, Kuruki feels deeply upset and powerless to change the situation. Overwhelmed by sadness, she stops eating her lunch and gradually begins to neglect her health. Continuing this pattern for several days takes a toll on her body, and one day in class, she suddenly falls ill. She is quickly taken to the infirmary, where it's discovered that her condition is due to not eating properly for an extended period. The teacher advises her to take better care of her meals to avoid such situations in the future. Then we see Kuruki reflecting on her mistakes and deciding to resume her lunch routine. This time, she finds an abandoned classroom and feels a sense of familiarity similar to her last hideout. Feeling happy and comfortable, she begins to have her lunch there, finding solace in this new secluded spot. While sitting in class feeling sorry for herself, Kuruki is interrupted when the PE teacher enters and announces that the class is free to do as they please since the period is empty. As the teacher leaves, the students start chatting with each other, but Kuruki remains alone. She overhears conversations about the upcoming cultural festival, a special occasion for the whole school where every student participates in something to bring honor to the school. Kuruki, anxious about the idea of having to collaborate with others for the festival, starts looking for ways to avoid participating. Then an idea strikes her, and she decides to join one of the school clubs. There are many different clubs at school, each filled with various students. By joining a particular club, Kuruki plans to keep herself occupied and stay away from the cultural festival preparations. Kuruki soon faces a significant challenge. To join a club, she needed permission from the school authorities, and she had to wait for a week for their decision. 
she returns home and starts pondering over her club membership. She spends the entire night writing a letter for her club application and, after much thought, submits it the next day. Kurmuki had resolved to join a club to try and integrate with other students, hoping it would help her overcome her introverted tendencies. A week passes quickly, and we see her eagerly checking for a response to her letter. To her dismay, she finds that the authorities have rejected her application. Confused and disheartened, she struggles to understand why her request was denied and wonders how she will fulfill her dream of being more involved in school activities. But there was no doubt that the rejection had shattered Karuki internally, and she had become completely engulfed in sadness. With time, the preparations for the cultural festival in her class were in full swing, and every student in the school was busy with some task. However, Karuki, saddened by her fate, stood apart, feeling like a stone amidst the bustling activity. Kurmuki observed how each student was engrossed in their work and began to feel jealous internally. She pretended that it didn't matter to her, but deep down, she longed to be a part of the group and work alongside her classmates. Later, we see two students who are working on cutting some materials from the festival. They had to step away for another task and were looking for someone to help continue their work. Meanwhile, Kurmuki, overhearing their conversation, decides to offer her help. Gathering her courage, she approaches them and offers to assist with their task. The two girls are delighted with Kuruki's offer of help and gladly share their work with her before leaving. Kuruki learns that she needs to cut different sections of approximately 100 or more pages. In a way, this task suits her, as it allows her to spend the whole day occupied and even considers taking her time to complete the work slowly. She begins cutting the pages, content with the thought that she can easily spend the whole day on this task. However, Kuruki's happiness is short-lived. The two girls who initially asked for her help send two boys to assist Kuruki intending to finish the work quickly. Kurumki doesn't appreciate this and feels as if her plans are being disrupted. Resigned to finishing the task as soon as possible, she starts cutting the pages with a blade. In her haste, the blade slips and cuts her hand, causing it to bleed. Not wanting to share this incident with anyone, Kuruki quickly heads towards the infirmary. Kuruki was running so fast that she collided with a student and fell to the ground, causing the other student's papers to scatter all over the place. Feeling embarrassed about her clumsiness, Kuruki starts to help pick up the pages, but during this, the blood from her hand starts to stain the papers. The other student, surprised by Kuruki's actions, becomes concerned when she realizes that Kuruki is bleeding. Without hesitation, she assists Kuruki to the infirmary. It is then revealed that this student is actually the head girl of the school responsible for managing all student activities. After getting her hand bandaged, Kuruki starts exploring various school activities, her attention is drawn to the music activities, and she briefly considers joining but soon backs out, realizing she couldn't become a good musician like the others. She worries about facing challenges like not being punctual or lacking a genuine interest in music. Acknowledging these potential problems, she decides not to pursue it. Later, we see her contributing to smaller tasks around the school, like setting up chairs in the auditorium. After completing her work, she sits down tired and is soon approached by the head girl. The head girl is grateful for Karuki's help, especially considering her injured hand. This appreciation makes Karuki feel a bit more relaxed and valued. As the school day comes to an end, we see Karuki heading home. Before leaving, she picks up a school dress, which she tries on as soon as she gets home. The next day, Karuki arrives at school, determined to enjoy the first day of the cultural festival. Initially, a boy offers her dumplings, which she accepts and eats, but this turns out to be a big mistake. The dumplings, though appealing in appearance, are tasteless and upset her stomach. Despite feeling unwell, Kuruki manages to make her way to the music concert. She tries to mingle with the crowd, but her efforts are fruitless. The concert itself doesn't bring her any joy, and her discomfort from the dumplings only worsens her experience. In the next scene, we see Kuruki at home, reflecting on her unfortunate first day at the festival. Eager to make the next day better, she comes up with an idea and decides to call Yu Chan for company. Yu Shan, being a good friend, has always been there to help Karuki at every turn. Understanding Karuki's situation, she agrees to join her, and they plan to spend the next day of the festival together. The next day, we see the head girl dressed as a teddy bear, giving balloons to some students as gifts from her. This act is a gesture of kindness and engagement with the children. Meanwhile, Karuki is waiting for Yu Chan, hoping that being seen with her, who is popular, will enhance her own reputation among the school students. After a short wait, she finally meets Yu Chan who has been waiting for her in the class and warmly greets her with a hug upon her arrival. Throughout the festival, Koruki spends time with Yu Chan, and they both enjoy the various activities together. They encounter some of Yu Chan's school friends and Koruki interacts with them, further expanding her social circle. By the end of the day, Koruki and Yu Chan participate in numerous festival activities, including visiting a haunted house and enjoying food together. 
As they enjoy the various activities, the day quickly passes and Karuki realizes that while she often feels alone, she doesn't feel this loneliness when she's with Yu Chan. She acknowledges the fun and enjoyment she has experienced with her. After school, Yu Chan leaves with her other school friends and Karuki finds herself alone again. A wave of sadness washes over her. But this time, her melancholy is noticed by the head girl still dressed in her teddy costume. The head girl approaches Karuki, gives her a balloon, and embraces her warmly. This moment highlights the head girl's genuine kindness and concern for Karuki. It's a poignant reminder of the impact that small gestures of compassion can have. With the conclusion of the day's festival activities, the cultural festival also comes to an end. Karuki returns to her regular school routine, going home every day just like before. However, she now finds herself more successful in conversing with her teachers compared to the past. Despite these improvements, Karuki still finds herself pondering over things she has never done or experienced at school before. Karuki soon realizes that she hasn't made any friends and has almost wasted her early years of school life. This realization hits her hard and she understands the need to set a goal for herself to move forward. However, she is troubled by not knowing what she should aim for in the future. She decides to discuss this with Yu Chan, and Yu Chan's response leaves her astonished. Yu Chan reminds her of a time when they were younger and Karuki had playfully said she wanted to run a gun business, a goal that was unique compared to other students. Yu Chan suggests Karuki should consider pursuing this unusual ambition. However, Karuki knows she had said those things in jest. She starts thinking about pursuing a different path for her future. When she asks her brother for help with this new direction, he does not offer any assistance. Karuki returns to school the next morning, determined to do something new that would leave a lasting impression on her classmates. First, she wants to find out whether any of the other students even think about her. To do this, she starts observing the students discreetly, conducting her own form of research. After much observation, she discovers that no one talks about her, which leaves her feeling quite disheartened. However, Karuki is not one to give up easily. She devises a plan where she releases cockroaches in the middle of the classroom. As the other students panic, she steps forward heroically and kills the cockroach. Karuki hopes this act will make her the talk of the school, with students spreading positive stories about how she saved the class. But to her dismay, the plan backfires. Instead of praise, the students start speaking negatively about her, blaming her for the cockroach incident. This outcome leaves her feeling even worse, as it turns out to be opposite of what she had hoped for. Having lost all hope, Haruki's attention shifts to the head girl, who was the complete opposite of her. The head girl was adept at helping others and effortlessly mingling with everyone. Kuroki starts to aspire to be like her, following her around to observe and learn. However, she soon realizes that she can't simply transform into someone like the head girl, no matter how hard she tries. Disheartened by this realization, she returns home. As Kuroki is leaving, the head girl notices her. She understands that Kuroki wants to talk but lacks the courage to do so. Seeing this, the head girl decides to step forward and help Karuki in the future. On the other side, Karuki was feeling extremely down and started running towards her home at all costs. During this, Yu Chan sees her rushing and tries to stop her, but Karuki keeps running without looking back, heading straight home. Once she arrives, she immediately lies on her bed and starts crying. That same night, when Karuki's mom calls her for dinner, Karuki is fixated on her computer screen. She had searched for information about girls who lack relationships and social life, and found that they are often labeled as misfits. This revelation oddly makes Karuki laugh. It was clear that she didn't consider herself a misfit and still saw herself as no less than a popular girl. So with this, the story comes to an end and I will see you in the next one.